This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, 35 years ago today, actually, I shouldn't say today, 35 years ago, <laughs> Friday the 13th, the final chapter came out. It was, of course, released in April that year, so I had the date wrong, but nonetheless, it featured my favorite Jason out of the bunch, and uh, I've had that stuntman slash actor on my show three years ago, and I'm blessed to have him back on today. Folks, I give you the wonderfully gifted, talented Ted White. How do you do, Ted? How can I even come on after that introduction? My gosh, I'm so flattered. I'm fine and dandy. Go ahead, pal. <laughs> well, you know what? 35 years since that film came out. And, uh, <laughs> well, of course, you've had a lot of films come out years before that, because I know you was telling me about the, the film with the rhinoceros. <laughs> and, yeah. Oh, yeah, that that was in Africa. That was a movie called Hattari with John Wayne. Mm -hmm. I think we did that in 1960. Yes. Yes, I, uh, I guess John Wayne was quite happy to have you double him as opposed to him taking on the rhino, huh? Uh, well, you know what? Uh, that little rhino episode, it got around the world pretty good. I mean, I, I never thought that what happened that day in that rhino uh, would get as much attention as it did, but uh, I'm glad it did because the film, the film uh, was worth it. Uh, it was fun making the film, but it was a very long, hard, hard film to make. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very difficult in Africa with the heat and so forth. Plus, we had two casualties on the show, which didn't help us at all. You know, one of one of our white hunters uh, got killed in a traffic accident. Oh. And then a stunt double for, um, I can't think of her name, the leading lady. Okay. Uh, um, she's an Italian girl. Gosh, I can't think of her name. Who is the director of the film? Pardon? Who was the director of the film? I know. Howard Hawks. Okay, Howard Hawks. Yeah, I knew you had a, a famous director for that film because I could uh, look that El up. Oh, El Elsa Martinelli was the girl. Oh, okay. Yeah, her double, I brought a double in for her, and the double has a male lion from a cub, just a baby. Mm -hmm. And uh, she actually lived, lived right in her home with her, mm -hmm. and her and her husband. And uh, so, you know, I mean, she could do anything in the world with a lion. It do it. It just fall, would have followed her around like a pet. Yeah. So she brought the lion on the show, and uh, uh, unbeknownst to us, and and one day she wasn't thinking either. Uh, she was having her period. Ooh. And the lion was on a long, long chain, uh, and about oh, 20 feet of chain. And then he was on that chain was hooked to a cable. They'd give him about a hundred foot run in each direction, mm -hmm. and uh, she took me out, me and and a photographer out, uh, to introduce us to the line because we use it in the show. Mm -hmm. Well, we were going to use it in the show, uh, and she called to it, and he was laying down, and he got up and started walking toward her, and then he started trotting, and she said something's wrong with him. Both of you guys stand back out of the length of the chain, so we moved back out of the length and. Uh, when he got about 10 feet from her, he sprang, and he hit her while he was still in the air. And just, well, I won't go into what, how bad it was, but it was, he, he, he killed her instantly. Oh. It, just instantly. Uh, it was a horrible sight to see, but, uh, you know, I learned a long time ago, tame animals are never tame. Tame animals just put up with us until they're ready to do something, and then they do it. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so much for all that. Oh, that's. Would you say that's the most dangerous stunt you've had in your career with the rhino? Well, oh no, oh no, my goodness, no. Oh, name no, some no. of your no, others. I, I've, I've, I've had other things in my career that are by far more dangerous than that, little, that, that shot. That was just, uh, you know, the, the one-time thing. Uh, it was dangerous. It wasn't, it, and actually, that wasn't a stunt. You know, that was just a, a timing thing, hoping the timing was right. And it, it, as it did turn out, it was right. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it did look good, and it was, it, it was, it was on the, it, it stayed in the film. But no, I've done shows where 
the stunts I've done were so dangerous, and they, and yet they never appeared in the film. Oh. So they didn't have room for them, one way or another, you know. But that's part of the business. What was your most dangerous stunt that you can think I beg of? beg pardon? What was your most dangerous stunt? Oh, well, let me... <laughs> <laughs> I guess the most dangerous stunt was I was on the top of a train. Mm-hmm. The train's doing about, I think, 30 miles an hour. And uh, I get shot and go off the side and... Uh, where, we, where they shoot me at in this part of the scene where we're shooting is over a bridge, and it's 300 feet to the bottom. And uh, they put a net, uh, the length of the bridge, which was, I think, it was 50 feet. And the net was 50, 50 some odd feet long and 14 feet wide. So I had to hit into that net. If I missed, well, I wouldn't have been here today to talk to you. Ooh. And as it was, I hit three feet from the edge of it. Oh. So, you know, you, you calculate these things, and you hope they're right. And uh, then when you do them, and while, if, even while I was in the air going toward it, I thought I was going to miss it. Oh. I never thought I'd land in it. What was this for? It was for a thing called You Ask For It. Okay. It, 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 that was a TV series. Years ago, uh, they called for things like that. They wanted to see different things shot. Uh, one, one of them was they wanted to see a, a guy jump from uh, an, uh, an airplane and bulldog a guy off a horse. And an old stuntman who's passed away now, Hal Needham, did that. Mm -hmm. But different stuntmen did different things on that show because it was called You Ask For It. And this was another one, uh, the same thing, You Ask For It. You worked with Hal Needham, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I was, yeah, I worked. No, he worked with me. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I was in the business 30 years before he got into it. I'm most familiar with him as a director, of course, you know, the Smokey and the Bandit and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, obviously, light, fast cars. <laughs> well, you know, he was, uh, he was a guy that grew up uh, from a very, very poor family, and uh, he was a tree trimmer. He used to go up these big, tall trees and trim up, trim up the edges of them. Uh, he worked 130 feet off the ground, just small cables, tightening and keeping him on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So he was used to the high stuff. And when he came into the business, he caught on right away. And uh, he became a good stuntman before it was over with. Mm -hmm. Well, you worked with a lot of great people. John Wayne, Clark Gable, um, Lee Marvin. Like, I remember you and I was talking the last interview uh a lot of the people you double whip and some of the stories, you know, and uh, and one of the things you don't hear a lot of in the media because the media likes to glamorize stuff that it, it shouldn't, but I loved hearing about how humble these people are from your perspective. Well, you know, what most people don't really realize is a star lives a very lon lonesome life. That I know a lot of people don't believe that at all because they're, they're sought after, their autographs are sought after, their pictures are sought after. Mm -hmm. uh, but they lead a very, very lonesome life, really. They, uh, uh, they're they not as, well, they're accepted any place in the world, of course. Uh, it's, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when they wake up in the morning uh, and look around, it's just another day for them. Uh, and it's not a day like you and I, when we wake up, first thing we think about is breakfast. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing one of those the names these big stars think about, like John Wayne, Clark Gable, Victor Matua, Rock Hudson, what show am I doing today? What lines do I have? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a big difference in, in what, how they think, how they feel about the business they're in. Uh, sometimes uh, it's very gratifying to have that position in life, mm -hmm. and then sometimes uh, it's not so gratifying. You'd like to wake up and say, well, Today, I don't want to do anything. I like to just go out and sit on the beach and just sit in the sun for a while and uh, watch the waves come in. But you're not allowed to do that. You've got a show to do, and you're going to do it. And so you get up and go and do and you make yourself laugh and smile and say you're happy when really and truly you're not. Yeah. And it's go just the other way around. It's all the same, you know, the same thing. I mean, uh, you go to a show that uh, you're not intending, you're not intending, you're not, your intention is to give them everything they ask for. And when you get there, you find you got the director 
It's asking for something it's impossible to do. Uh, there's all kinds of ifs and ands in stunt work, uh, in anything, in parts of life, making motion pictures. Mm -hmm. Would you say that Clark Gable was uh, your your uh, your wife's favorite person you doubled for? Because I know you told a story in the last interview that <laughs> your wife would always uh, uh, take a call from Clark. Well, you know, I, he and I were great friends. Mm -hmm. uh, I fished with him and hunted with him. And he was over at the house many times. Uh, we uh, we traveled together a lot when we were hunting and fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, he was just a good guy and a good friend. And uh, it wasn't like he was a star and I was a double. Uh, of course, that was a, uh, a given. Uh, but as far as, as a, just a really true friend, he was that. Uh, in fact, uh, there are guys that, uh, that knew him before I did that had known him for 30, 40 years that were his friends from the day he died. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, at his funeral was one of the biggest funerals in California, I think. I don't think it was one ever, anything as big as his. Mm. Well, you know, um, of course, uh, a lot of people are familiar with you of playing Jason in Friday the 13th, the final chapter. Uh, out of everything you've done, and you've done some extraordinary uh, work and stunts, um, what do you think about the fact that this seems to be the, what people picture uh, when your name comes up? Well, you know what? That's a good question. That hasn't been asked before. Uh, people that are, are uh, fanatics for motion pictures and, uh, and keeping track of the big names in the business, the big name stars like Cable and Wayne and uh, Lee Marvin, all those big names, uh, they do know uh, some of the stunt work. They do know some of the stunt people. They know their names and so forth. Uh, these are hard, fast uh, movie goers that that, uh, that that's their whole life. Mm -hmm. And they every time they see you, they're doing it as much as you're doing it. Uh, it's hard for people to understand that, but um, yeah, uh, I, I meet those people every day when I go on a convention. Hey, that they. When I go, you know, when they come up and ask for an autograph picture, and I give them a picture and an autograph, and they say, "Ted, what's the most exciting show you've ever done?" Well, you know what? Mm -hmm. That's a kind of a standard question, and I got a standard answer. Yeah. Nearly every show I ever did was the most exciting show I've ever done, mm -hmm. and that's really partially true, because you weren't working until you got that show, so it became exciting to do that particular show. Yeah. And people don't understand that, you know. They they think in Hollywood, they think the people in Hollywood work every day, every hour, every minute, which is so far from the truth. You know, we're lucky if we work six months out of the year. We're, we're not lucky. We're just excited to get worked six months out of the year. Uh, now, with stunt people, that's not true. Uh, we normally work eight to nine months out of the year because we, we're, we're, we're working for other people, doubling other people. Yeah. We're not doing ourselves in a part or something like that, which makes us, uh, which, which, which gives us more latitude as far as earning money. Yes. Well, you, uh, of course, I, as I said before, you were my favorite Jason out of the series. And, and um, I know that you had related before that, um, I don't know whether it was Joseph Zito or Frank Mancuso, one of the others said that, uh, they thought was wrong that you were running in the film. You should have walked. But you know what? I think you running after uh, Kimberly Beck, I think that was more terrifying than him walking after them, you know? Well, let me tell you what, exactly what happened that evening. Mm -hmm. This was at night and in the rain. Yep. And uh, Joe Zito and I, I, I had never worked with him before. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the first time. And he never, he, he never really directed me as far as, as a director should, what a director should do, uh, 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 at this po at this point in the film, I'd only been working with him, I think four or five days at this point when we, when uh, when the walking and running thing came came up, mm -hmm. so he, he he never said Ted, I want you to do this, I want you to do that, he just let uh, let me do exactly what the script called for, but this particular night, uh, I had seen Friday the Thirteenth. My sons, both of my sons had seen it and took me to see it one night, knowing that I was going to do one. 
Okay. And I watched uh, I watched the character Jason and how he moved and so forth. And he was more like Boris Karloff, that stalking type thing. Yeah. And I thought, well, you know, I, I, I don't want to play him that way. I'd like to play him as a as a person that's healthy and strong and yep. viral and, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't want him to be handicapped before the film starts. That's right. So that's what I did. I, I decided, instead of, that, instead of walking after him, I ran. And Zito cut, said, cut. And said, I, I, came, he came, I came back over to him. I said, what's the matter? And he said, what, what the hell are you doing running? And I said, well, I'm not crippled. I said, trying to catch that girl. If I wanted to catch her, I have to run to catch her. I can't catch her walking. And I said, it looks ridiculous for me to walk. Here I am, a six foot four, 220 pound guy, mm-hmm. healthy as I can be, and I'm not running. Tell me the reason I'm not running. Exactly. So he was at odds to come up with a reason. And he said, well, oh, Dick Man, I mean, Mancusco Jr. was the executive producer. Yep. And he came over and got into the, the discussion with us. And he said, I like to see, I like what Ted did, the running part. That's the exciting part. We thought maybe he would have caught her. <coughs> Excuse me. So anyway, that's that's how that all happened. Well, I think it was a great move because, like, you're just scant inches behind her. And I love that there where you're facing each other on the top of the stairs. And, and she's like a, a scared animal that's either going to go through you or out that window. And she goes out that window. And uh, I, I love that whole sequence. It's like, talk about... Uh, doing everything you can to survive. And to top it off, she doesn't know whether she's going to live when she lands because she's got a kid over at the house. <laughs> she's uh, hoping that uh, gets out of there. Well, the girl we had doing that, the double, mm-hmm. uh, when she went through the window, she hit on the top of a car. Yeah. Uh, and that was about a 10-foot drop down to the top of this car. And we put explosives inside the car and blew the windows out. At the same time she hit the top of the car, we blew all the windows out. That's supposedly the concussion from her hitting the top. Uh, it blew the windows out, but we did it with dyna- We did it with uh, squibs, you know, dynamite squibs. Yeah. Uh, and that worked out fine. It looked good. Yeah, that was a different sequence. Uh, the Kimberly Beck actually hit the ground. It was one of the twins that hit the car. Well, the, the stuff was Kimberly. Mm-hmm. I guess the stuff starting upstairs with the TV set going over my head mm-hmm. and then coming down in the fight all the way down the stairway and at the bottom. Uh, and she's what a trooper she is. Oh, yeah. She's what a, just what a girl that put up with all the nonsense of me fighting with her and, and me. And then I have to be very careful with her because she's a little frail girl. She's not, you know, a big, strong person. And I had to be very careful that handling her that I didn't bruise her to a point that she could that she couldn't do the next day's work. Uh, and we and and it got it got to the point where uh Zito wanted more of the action between her between the girl and I and I kept trying to tell him if you can't get too much because I'm gonna end up hurting her. Mm-hmm. And uh consequently I, I had to finally say no to him. We I don't want to do that anymore. I, I'm just I got to a point where I knew that if I handled her any rougher than what I was handling her, I was going to hurt her. And it wasn't worth it just to make a film. No. I love that uh, sequence where you come to the door and and she takes the machete and just misses you and it hits the door and and she just swings that machete. And I love that when it goes right into you between your fingers, you know. (laughs) Some great work by Tom Savini there with the the gore effects. And you're right, that was Tom Savini. Mm -hmm. He put all that stuff together. You know, and I I, I had never met Tom. I'd I'd never worked with him before that film. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the first time I met him, they were putting makeup on me. Mm-hmm. And the makeup, the first makeup they put on me was pieces of uh, rubber. They glued them to my face. This was a three and a half hour makeup job. Mm-hmm. It cost the studios tons of money, and they finally made up one rubber mask that just went over my whole head and it glued down around my neck, uh, and that saved three and a half hours of makeup time. Yeah. But uh, yeah, they, you know, we tried to make it as simple as possible, and yet keep it as genuine as possible as far as the makeup because people really look at the makeup very, very close. Yeah. 
Well, Tom did the first one, so, I mean, he came back to, to kill Jason off. Un, unbeknownst to him, they were going to make more. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, um, I don't know whether your biggest stunt in the film was working with Corey Feldman. or. <laughs> <laughs> well, n- not really, no. <laughs> and, and Corey, you know, at that time, he's just 11 years old. Yeah. And his mother brought him to the set, and he's an 11-year-old kid on a set with all grown-ups, no kids to play with. Mm-hmm. And naturally, he's going to he's going to get in trouble, you know, he, uh, only because he had to do something to occupy his time. He wasn't always on that. The camera wasn't on him all the time. The camera was, all, in fact, he only worked a very few minutes of each day that I worked with him. Uh, so anyway, he he got very mischievous. He got into a little trouble. But only because he was, he was well, he was lonesome. He had nobody to play with, and, and number two, he wanted to get into the film. You really and truly, he's a good actor, a good little yes. actor. Well, he's a, involved in Thirteen Fanboy, which of course I'm a co-producer on right now. So uh, uh, I think that's pretty cool that uh, a lot of the Friday alumni are in that, and. Uh, and I know Corey's had some rough. I won't get into details of what's gone on with him recently, you know, but I've seen it. But uh, I hope he uh, gets his act together and uh, because I know there's a lot of people that like to see him. Well, I, I, heard, I heard that he got married. Well, yeah, yeah he is married, yeah. And uh, I, now the last time I saw him was, I think, three years ago. And I, I think that was in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we talk, you know, we're not, uh, I have no hard feelings with him. Uh, and he's a nice guy. I just hope that, he, like like you said, and like other people I've known said, that gets, he gets his act together and uh, tries to make a little more of himself than what he is right now. Yeah. Well, I know somebody you are in touch with, of course, Judy Aronson, and uh, she is always nice to see uh, in whatever movies that she's in. I interviewed Vernon Wells, who worked with her in Weird Science, and he he related that he really liked working with her. And I know that uh, you're still in touch with her to this day. And uh, I I loved how you kind of came to her you came to her rescue there on the set there, and uh, and I think that uh, made a great friendship for you. You know. Uh, and that poor girl still suffers from that to this day. Oh. Uh, she was, you know, her ears and her throat, uh, uh, her nose. Uh, she's well. All I can tell you is this: that if she wanted to, she could have sued the studios for millions of dollars and got it. Yeah. Because keeping her in that water as long as they did in January, and it's 23 degrees and at night, uh, and there really wasn't any sense. Of they could have done it differently, much yep. differently than what they did. But it, that's you know that's over with now. So uh, I, ju- I just hope that she doesn't suffer from it any more than what she has so far. Well, she's going to be in Thirteen Fanboy, <laughs> and uh, she she seems very active. You know, I'm I'm going to try to get her on here. But but uh, last post I seen her uh, put online, she seems to have a good sense of humor. So. She's a great gal, mm-hmm. and she's a trooper. You know, she's right there with you every step of the way. Uh, she don't care if she's worked 14 hours and you want to work 15 or 16. She's going to go right ahead and do her part and make it look good. Uh, I, for one, would tell anybody that asked me about her for a part or anything that she's a real trooper. She'd give you everything she's got, and no matter how tough it is, she'd be right there with the rest of the group when they're doing it. Uh, she won't back away from anything. Yeah, well, we all love Judy Aronson, and uh, yeah, that that was a, a hard uh, sequence, you know, and she really gave it her all in that scene, her, her death scene in there, but it's unfortunate that uh, things got bad the way they did, but but uh, we all wish her well. Well, I think, I, you know, like I said, I, and I'm being a little redundant, she, uh, she's never going to be well. Uh, she's going to suffer from that the rest of her life uh and i at, really and truly at one point I, I talked to her about actually talking to the studios and, and make some kind of a settlement with her with them but she said no she didn't want to do it uh, you know she'd want to she would jeopardize her career in the business uh and as far as i know she never has done anything she's let it go 
but had you have been there and, and saw what I saw and saw what happened to her afterwards, it's, it, there's not enough money. They couldn't pay her enough money to do it and have it done over again. Well, I want to express my appreciation and thanks that uh, you stepped in and uh, did what you did because uh, – um, we need people like you uh, on film sets that watch over people, and uh, that is something I really respect. Well, you know, she she asked Joe Zito mm -hmm. when she was in a she was in a bikini bathing suit. This was in January at about one o'clock in the morning, and she was in this little rubber tube uh, on this lake. And in this bikini bathing suit, and she was freezing to death. I mean, she was her teeth were chattering. Yeah. She said, "Could I get out and get warm for just a minute?" He said, "No, we're putting new film in the camera. It'll just be a few minutes longer." Well, it was a lot longer than a few minutes, and she asked him two or three more times, and he said, "No, two or three. And then finally, I said, "Joe, she's got to get out. Look at her. She's turning blue." He said, "You stick to your acting. I'll stick to directing." And I said, "You son of a bitch." He either gets out or I'll walk off the goddamn film. I've had enough of your bullshit. Yep. And he said, what do you mean? You? I said, I'll walk. You won't get another a foot of film with me. So he said, we'll get her out. So they, they they pulled her in. She got out. They put blankets around her. They gave her warm coffee. She was out for an hour and a half before she's even back to halfway normal. Yeah. And Zito and I, I told him, I said, Zito, when this movie's done, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. <laughs> And I meant it. I was sincere about it because he didn't care. He really didn't care. All he cared, all he cared about was getting his part of the film done. He didn't care about the people. None, nothing. He had 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 no concern for your health at all. Did you beat the shit out of him? No. <laughs> <laughs> when the last shot was done, he disappeared. That was in the evening. And the first thing I know, I was looking for him, and he got in his car and took off. I haven't seen him since. <laughs> you pulled a Jason on him, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It was wrong what he did. It was just totally wrong. He took he took uh, this girl that w was trying to be nice and do what he wanted done and put her in harm's way mm -hmm. to a point that at the rest of her life she's suffering from it. That's not right, you know. Yes, you're right. Yeah, I've had a few other stunt people on here, Jean Couture and uh, Marnie Lynn Field, and uh, that couple that come to mind. Have you ever worked with them? No, I never did. No? Uh, well, well no, but, let, but let me give you a reason why. Okay. Uh, about 85% of the films that I did were westerns. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I double all the big guys, and... Uh, I'm a Western guy to begin with. Uh, I have a, I've always had horses. Mm -hmm. I rodeoed professionally for years. Okay. And so uh, I, I tend to work at, I did those shows. I took those shows against other shows like with cars and so forth. But uh, again, I, I did work with cars a lot and uh, I worked with boats a lot, airplanes too. Uh, but yeah, I was in a Western motif. Uh, that, that, was, that was what I, that's what, that's where I excelled, I think. Okay. Did you go to the premiere of Friday the 13th, the final chapter? You know what? They sent a, they sent a limo to pick my wife and I up, and uh, we got dressed, <laughs> went down, I sat down, and, uh, oh, they introduced me first uh, to the audience. We had a, The place was full. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the lights went out, the, the, the car they brought us in was waiting for us outside, we got up and walked right back out again, got in the car and came home. Well, we'd already seen it, you know, three or four times. Okay. But, yeah, they did. They said, they said transportation brought us there and introduced us to the people and so forth. What did your wife think of the film? Well, you know, again, <laughs> uh, like me, she, she had never gone to a movie of that type. <laughs> yeah. It's just not what she'd go and see. So she, she thought that, you know, making a movie like that, well, in this business that I'm in, you know, we we can't do what we want to do all the time. We do what we have to do to make a living. Yep. So, uh, you know, yeah, and here here comes Friday the 13th and putting the makeup on and so forth. Well, it was just another way of making a living and, and uh, you know, paying my bills like anybody else and paying my car payments and my house payments uh, and taking care of business around my home. 
So, yeah, I, I said, well, sure, I'll, I'll take a look at that to be working. Even It's Friday the 13th, but it could have been Friday the 17th or Friday the 20th. Mm-hmm. That wouldn't have, it wouldn't have made any difference to me. I was, I was working. Does your wife have a favorite film that you've done? Beg your pardon? Does your wife have a favorite film that you've done? I don't know. Jerry, do you have a favorite film that I've done? <laughs> <laughs> Starman. 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 Okay, nice yeah. choice. That's uh, John Carpenter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you like working with John Carpenter? He is a wonderful, wonderful man. I flew back from New Jersey with John. Uh, we were, we were both on the same plane, was and uh, we were sitting uh, right across the aisle from each other. But that's that's uh, I had worked with him once before, so I did two films with him. I oh, yeah, you did Escape from New York. Did, just a minute, what, Lenny? Jeff Bridges? Yeah, yeah well, Jeff Bridges, yeah. Well, you did four films. I did four with Jeff Bridges. Ben Solon, Yeah. Starman. I did, I did four in a row with Jeff Bridges. But anyway. Jeff Bridges, I love Jeff Bridges. If you haven't seen The Big Lebowski. No, I haven't. you got to see that. That is what Jeff Bridges is known for now. It's The Big Lebowski, and he loves it. <laughs> you know, he's got a band. Yes, I know. And he travels all up and down the West Coast and, and uh, plays at different nightclubs. Mm-hmm. He's a, he's a nice guy he's a, and a really trooper. I heard a real, that. Real good guy to work with. Well, if you haven't seen The Big Lebowski by the Coen Brothers, that is just a masterful performance by Jeff Bridges, and it's very funny. <laughs> Yeah, that, I recommend that strongly. And the Coen Brothers are, of course, great filmmakers, so you get good quality. Well, I, I, you know, they did a film, uh, they did a remake of a film that John Wayne did. Yeah, True Grit, and it had yeah, Je- Jeff yeah, Bridges. They, they did that, and uh, I, now I did go see it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, didn't, I, I hate to say this because I, the guy that did the lead in it is a good friend. Yeah. Uh, I just don't think that they should have tried to put someone on a, in a John Wayne film in his position and have it to be successful it's just that's awfully hard to do that's hard to do like i mean i resented when they remade psycho and the remake of psycho was horrible <laughs> well you yep. know uh, i don't know there's sometimes the remake is better than the original but that's the odds on that are about ten thousand to one yes you're right yeah. you're right did you did you? Uh, we're going to wind down here for a minute in a minute, but I wanted to know. Um, there's a lot of graphic kills and whatnot in Friday the Thirteenth, the final chapter. Did you have a favorite in terms of the technique and whatnot? Did you have a favorite? I didn't. I, I didn't have a favorite. There was one that I did that I thought actually showed more of of a kill, and that was in the bathroom where I got the guy was taking a shower. Oh, Peter and Barton. <laughs> I, yeah. What a, that, what a good kid he is, and another trooper. Mm-hmm. And I smashed his head against the wall. Uh, that I think that would be as far as, as far as favorite kills. <laughs> the, the term <laughs> favorite kills. I laugh at that, but anyway, that that that's my favorite part of the film. Yeah, and they have really showed Jason's strength too, just going right through that glass. And <laughs> well, they make a Superman out of him. Well, they've since had him come back from the grave, but the films have really, after the sixth one, I did like part six, but after that, they, they, they were some hit and miss. There's some good stuff I liked in all of them, you know, but I found uh, once they started throwing him into space, it got ridiculous, you know. Oh uh, yeah, Jason went to space, and so yeah. Well, yeah. see that, that there again, writers step way, way beyond their means mm-hmm. of, of putting a, a character that's already been established and then putting him up in outer space. It's a ridiculous thing. And it didn't make any money. It nope. Just, it, it, all it did was give the film, give that, you know, Jason character a black eye. I would have suggested doing a Friday the 13th in winter. That hasn't been done. Could you imagine? Well, yeah, he- could you use that going back east in the snow back in New York or someplace or... New Jersey? Yep. Yeah, that would have been good. Yeah, have that's them, another form. Have them break out of the ice, you know? And, sure. Or what they can do, if, if they have a better budget, is take Jason Takes Manhattan and make the film that they originally wanted to make. 
Well, th- you know, they did have a film where Jason went to New York. Yeah, I know, but most of it took place in, on a boat, and uh, the Manhattan scenes were actually Vancouver. And I, I'm going to tell you, um, the film hit, hit a backlash for it. And that was when Paramount kind of pulled support on the films. Well, see, Paramount, at that time, the president of Paramount, uh, i got to think of his name. I should know him very well, too. Mm. Who? When you did the movie? Yeah. Mancusco. Oh, yeah, Mancusco Jr. Yeah. Uh, he was, he was, his dad was the head of Paramount. Okay. Uh, and he was, he, was a, he was the executive producer of our film, mm-hmm. uh, Friday the 13th. Yeah. I'm sure I was, there was something else I was going to tell you, but I, I, I've kind of lost my thought there. <laughs> well, you know what? 35 years since that movie passed. I'm pretty sure you get a lot of people at conventions that approach you over that film. You probably saw a lot of photos of yourself as Jason, huh? You know what? I, if I tried to count them, I'd run out of fingers and toes. <laughs> it's just unbelievable how many people are talk, still talk to you about it to this day. And you know what? I let them. I let them have as much time as they want. Yeah. And I, I usually have a line of people for pictures. Yeah. But uh, they want to talk about it, and that's what they're paying to get in there for is to see you and say hello to you, shake your hand, take a picture with you. Mm-hmm. And I do not deny them that. I, I give them ever as much time as they want, uh, and I, I, that's just the way I am. That's the way I like it. And you've, of course, uh, met Kane Hodder, and you've you've met all the other Jasons. You know, what was your impression of them? Well, all of them are nice guys. Mm-hmm. Kane's a great guy. Yeah. He's a wonderful guy. Mm-hmm. But there's, you know, every one of those guys that did uh, Jason, most of them, all of them except Kane, are bigger than me. Oh, wow. I always considered you a big guy. <laughs> I'm 6'4", but uh, Kane Hodder is 6'2", mm-hmm. and the rest of them are 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, Oh, wow. Yeah, they're big guys. Well, we lost Steve Dash and Richard oh, Hold Brooker, on just you know. a second. What yeah. I'm going with my mother. Okay, yeah. I'll see you later. Yeah, uh, Steve, I saw Steve for the last time in New York and had breakfast with him. Yeah. And he was telling me then that he wasn't feeling good. Oh. Uh, and that uh, he was living in Florida and li- he was living on a golf course and was playing golf every day while he was, wasn't working. Yeah, uh, I guess after one of those days, he got down there and had that heart attack and oh. just dropped dead. That's that's unfortunate. But he was a great guy again. Everybody liked him. Everybody. He, uh, you, uh, well, he he just he was the life of anybody's party. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, did you do you have you ever had anything really inter- like unique you've ever been asked to sign at these conventions? Say that again. When you go to these conventions, what's the most unique thing you've ever been asked to sign? (laughs) (laughs) Well, Uh, I'm going to tell you, but... (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I'm not going to tell you the most, but I'm going to tell you what led up to it. Okay, yeah, go. I've had to sign women's breasts. (laughs) I've I've signed on their cheeks and their butt. (laughs) I had a guy want me to sign on his dick. Oh! <laughs> no, I draw the line. I'm not going to sign on your dick. And then the, 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 uh, every one of these conventions have tattoo artists there. Yeah. And every time you sign something and they want to keep it, they go down and have a tattoo artist go over your uh, signing, you know, over your your signature, so they have it permanently. <laughs> and I I could just see somebody going down and 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 having one of these guys try to. You know, do the thing over his joint. <laughs> but I said, no, I'm not going to do it. Well, a- Alice Cooper said that that's one thing he draws the line at, too, is genitals. <laughs> <laughs> but I have, I've got women. My God, I've done everything with women. Uh, I've right up, right, you know, between her legs, just unbelievably close to, you know, and and, sign, and then they go down there and. They wear a bikini then and have the tattooed, they have the name tattooed into the skin. But uh, it's just, well, it's amazing when some of the places people with the tattoos. Well, you know, I don't have tattoos and I don't think I really need them. <laughs> oh. But I will, I do want to thank you that uh, when I interviewed you three years ago, you were very, very kind and sent me a, 
uh, an autographed picture of you coming through the window and grabbing Corey Feldman and Kimberly back about and ready to hammer you. I, I, let me give, let me give you my my email address. Or do you have my email address? Um, sure. I'm going to take that down. Yeah, and then I'll, I'll do an edit here so I take that out. So okay. send, send me an send me an email and tell me what you want. And then go to my website and there's all kinds of pictures on it. Pick out what you want and then let me know and I'll send it to you. Oh well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't mind paying for a picture. No, 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 no. I'm not gonna charge you for a picture. I got no. Well, you know what? I really appreciate that. Yeah. I, like I said, I know I sound like a broken record, but you're my favorite Jason out of the series. And I just interviewed Mike Guthridge, who uh, directed The Bone Garden, and he's uh, and uh, he's Mike Guthridge. Uh, Mike Guthridge. Uh, he he sent me Tracy Savage, who was in Part Three, and um, he's a big Friday fan. And he told me when he came on here a second time that you're his favorite Jason as well. Glad I got a favorite out there, you know, to think I'm the favorite. Yes. Uh, well, I, th I think you are the best, Jason. I think all the Jasons were great, but uh, I thought you were the scariest. I'm just going to say that I think the idea of you running after her, I think that made you more frightening. Well, that's what Joe Zito thought as well, you know, uh, afterwards. After uh, uh, our director, I mean, our producer said, that looked good. I was, I was, I was surprised that Ted was running, but that looks good. Let's keep it. Yes. So that that set the tone for it. I think so too, yeah. and I think pound for pound, uh, the Friday the Thirteenth, the final chapter, I think is one of the uh, uh, scariest of the franchise, and I also think that uh, I, I think can for give you some statistics if you'd like. Sure. Our the Friday the Thirteenth I did mm -hmm. outgross every one of the others. By thousands and thousands of dollars. Oh, I don't the highest grossing Friday thirteenth ever made. Yes. Yes. And uh I, I, I gotta say this too, that I remember when Freddy vs. Jason came out, I was disappointed that Ronnie Yu, the director of it, he watched the original Elm Street, which was fine, and he watched the original Friday the thirteenth, and that was all he'd seen. And I don't know how he could do a, a, anything to do with Jason by watching the original film. If it was me, I would have told him to watch either the final chapter or Jason Lives, part six, because they would have gotten the full spiel on Jason, either living or as uh, coming out of the grave, one or the other. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why he was brought in to direct Freddy versus Jason, but... If he was going to watch one film, it would have been. I would have suggested one of those two, because he would have got the whole gist of Friday the Thirteenth and Jason just through that. Well, here's what here's what you, uh, I'd like for you to do: go to my website, mm -hmm. look through it, and uh, I think I have one or two of the masks left. If you want a mask, I'll send you a mask. Uh, but the pictures you'll see, you'll see all the pictures. And pick out one you like and let me know, and I'll get them right out to the mail to you. Okay. How much are the masks? They're $100, but I'm not going to charge you that. I'm not going to charge you for a mask. Are you sure? I don't yeah, mind. Absolutely. No, 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 no. Don't worry about it. I would love a mask. <laughs> well, well, that's what I'll do. I'll get you a mask. You're 100% sure? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Well, how about I, I, I uh, get a, a, a mask and I, I buy a picture? I beg your pardon? How about I get a mask and I buy a picture? No, no, I can't sell you anything. Okay. I'll send you a picture and a mask. You'll send me a picture and a mask? Oh, yeah. Well, you know what, Ted? That That is very generous of you. I, I thank you so much for that. Well, listen, I, I've enjoyed this conversation we've had, and, uh, you know, I didn't have anything planned for it. It's just all been off the cuff. Yep. Uh, had I, I should have actually sat down and, and gone over my some stuff that I'd that I could have memorized mm -hmm. and maybe given you a better interview than what we've had. Oh, I think we had a great interview. Well, good. As long I, as you I'll, like it, that's all that counts. I, I've told people one of my fine, and I'm not pulling your leg. No, I One of the not. finest interviews I think I've done was with you, that, that first interview. I think it was one of the finest interviews I've done. Well, that's 
That's an awfully nice compliment. Yep. And I thank you for it. And I'm honored to have you come on here today, you know. I mean, I uh, this is not a waste for me. I'm, I'm honored, and uh, I, I appreciate it. And I thank you so much. You were willing to send me a mask and a, a picture. I, I seriously, I don't mind paying for it. No, and and you know what? I wouldn't let you pay for it at all. <laughs> no way, no. You know, I wish it was more than that I could do for you. But well, you've done a lot for me, and you've you know you've interviewed me twice, and mm-hmm. uh, that's a lot, you know, for an old guy like me now. And uh, but uh, it was nice. I've enjoyed the conversation. I've enjoyed listening to you, and you asking me all these different questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not done that often anymore because I don't take them. Uh, but guys that I've known, I do take them, and uh, it's probably one a year now. Well, you know what? Thank you so so much for coming on the show. I consider it a blessing. And, uh, yeah, I would love a mask. I'd, I, I'd definitely pick out a picture. I, I would okay, appreciate it. Okay, well, come on the website, pick out what you want, and let me know. I'll let you know. Now, before you go, can uh-huh. I get you to do a plug for my show? Okay. Hi, folks. I'm listening. I'm talking to Greg Gilbert with Python Paradise. And you know what, folks? I've forgotten the latter part. <laughs> what is it? Uh, New Brunswick, Canada. Yeah, I'm sorry, pal. That's all right. <laughs> well, you know what, Ted? This this was just this was wonderful to have you come on here and uh, and reminisce on this and uh, and uh, I'll try to get Judy on here and I'll tell her what a wonderful guy you are. Of course, she's oh, already okay. going to believe you. Me, she'll already believe me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Listen. Have a good day and God bless. We'll talk to you again. Absolutely. God bless you too.